this is page four of the synchronization notes and before I go any further with this page I want to review the two previous examples so here is the um, here's the event signal use case and um, task one and task two are running concurrently so you can think of that as they're running in parallel although they could possibly be sharing time on one processor so you don't know what order they're going to run in and uh, what's going to happen here is task one may run before task two you don't know so if it gets to its weight on s before task two has signaled it the count for s will be zero and task one will block there it will be taken off the ready queue and put it into a wait queue for this particular semaphore. Uh, task 2, uh, when it runs, will signal S which increments it, so uh, opposite to 1. Now if there was a task blocked, it will unblock that task, which will then decrement the count. Now if task 2 got there first, then it would signal an S would be at 1 when task 1 arrived at its weight and task 1 would not block at all because the value was already 1 so it would just decrement it down to 0 and proceed. One more thing to note here is that task 2 doesn't necessarily have to be a task in fact it's often the case that an interrupt service routine or an IRQ handler as ARM likes to call them will signal semaphores and that communicates some kind of meaning to a task that's been waiting for that to happen so that was the event signal use case. Here is the mutual exclusion use case. In this case the lock semaphore starts at 1 and the idea here is that task 1 and task 2 both have a critical section where they modify shared data so maybe you're creating a game and the shared data is the location of a sprite. A sprite is just a, a 2D object that can move around the screen. So maybe one of those tasks is updating its location and that involves setting multiple variables such as like a, an X and a Y coordinate, maybe other information. And maybe task 2 is drawing that to the screen. And you don't want task 2 to be halfway through reading that data while task 1 comes in and modifies some of that data on it. So you want them both to have exclusive access to that data when they're either reading or writing it. So that's what this will do. One of them will get to the wait lock instruction first and decrement it to zero so that if the second one comes along to the wait lock they will be blocked until the first one that acquired it signals the lock which will then kind of implicitly increase the semaphore to one but when it unblocks the other task, then that takes it back down to, to zero again. And so now we're going to look at a third use case. So our third use case is the task rendezvous. Nice French word there with uh, so Z and a V and stuff. Anyway, um, what we want to do here is we want to synchronize two tasks to start working together at the same time. So if we go back to the first use case, uh, the event signal, we want one task to wait until another task has done something. Um, in the second case, we want to make sure that they don't, both don't run at the same time. In this case, we want to ensure that both tasks don't proceed and pass a certain point in their code until they've both arrived. So synchronize to tasks to work at the same time. The steps in this case, well okay so before we had a semaphore that was initialized to zero if we want to make one task wait. In the second case we had two tasks that wanted to make sure only one of them ran out of time so we initialized the semaphore to one. In this case we need a different solution. We want two tasks to wait for each other until they've 
both signal that they've arrived at the same location. So we're going to use two semaphores. So initialize two semaphores. And in this case, we want them to wait. So equal to zero, that's the initial value. Then each task signals its semaphore. So task one will uh, signal semaphore one, and task two will signal semaphore two, and then each task waits the others semaphore. So let's look at uh, our pseudocode for this. So we've got our hypothetical semaphore type, call it semaphore, and task one semaphore, let's call it S1. That's going to be equal to zero or initialized to zero. And S2 for task two is initialized to zero. And as usual, we have a task one and a task two. And as usual, they loop forever. And so this looks a little bit similar to the mutual exclusion case. So they both do some work. So maybe they're both uh, processing half the data and then they're switching their data and doing the same processing to the other half. So one task may be doing one kind of transformation then the other task does another. So you both want them to wait until they've both done their first part before they swap data and do the second, for example. So here is the, um, the procedure. So task one will signal its semaphore S1 to tell task two or to communicate to task two that it has arrived at the rendezvous. And task two will signal its semaphore S2 for the same reason. And then task one will wait on task two semaphore task two will wait on S1 semaphore. And once they've reached that point, then they can both continue executing knowing that they have reached this rendezvous point. So this is our rendezvous. And really, they are rendezvousing at this point here, and those two lines are the mechanism that makes the rendezvous continue. And they may do this over and over again in, in that loop. There. And there's the code for task 2's rendezvous. Might as well label it. And that is our third use case.